for this, this conversation, um, I'm going to read a quote from a Senegalese filmmaker, Usman Semben, who offered these thoughts. He was in Cannes at a film festival and he said, it's good to be at Cannes, but I wish Africa could create something of its own. We should not be eternal guests. It is up to us to create our own values, to recognize them and to carry them through the world. We are not alone in the world, but we are our own sun. I do not define myself relative to Europe. In the darkest of darkness, if the other does not see me, I do see myself. And surely I do shine. So on that note, we're going to be welcoming Njereka Iroha, who is a cultural producer and a spoken word artist, and will, who will be joined by Bianca Amu Manu, who's coming from Ghana. And she's a curator, producer, writer, based in Accra, and you might have seen her upstairs at the Nubuke Foundation booth, as well as Folakunle Oshun, an artist and curator. And they will be speaking to experimentation and generating the relevant structures to produce work where they're based. So please, please give them a very, very warm welcome to the stage. Good evening, esteemed guests. Welcome to the final talk of today. Um, pleased to see you all. I'm sure it's been quite an intense day, a lot of impressions. And I hope we can continue in this spirit um, with today's conversation. We um, were already introduced with a quote, um, and I would also like to start my segment off with a quote. Nobody can teach me who I am. You can describe parts of me, but who I am, what I need, is something I have to find out myself. In various fields, Africans of the continent and the diaspora have sought to nurture a narrative of their own, which starts out with defining oneself and one's own needs. In a sense, today, we're looking at just that, what it takes to be our own son, to create sustainability for art and art production, for, pro for projects and for creatives to thrive, for art to be recognized in its full potential to move society. We look into the roles of cultural workers and art practitioners who create spaces for critical thought and for the arts to flourish. So I'm really pleased that you're joining us today. Thank you for your time um, that you're taking to share your expertise. I have this handy click to, for you to read also what we're talking about today. Amongst other things, reclaiming spaces or claiming spaces going to hear that a lot today, talking about space, be it space for discourses, to open discussion. Art X is a very important space that um, looks at the African perspective on arts and also creates a space of discussion, of deliberation. We are going to talk about reclaiming narratives, claiming narratives. the use of archives and the necessity of archives and strategies of creating archives. We're going to talk about urban spaces, reclaiming urban space, and the methods of shifting center and periphery. Where, where do we find centers? Where do we find the, the periphery? And how do we create access or accessibility um, for discussions, access to fundings, access to possibilities for artists to practice their craft, to reach others, to reach an audience, but also to reach fellow creatives. And we'll be talking about tools of sustainability. How do we sustain the work that is happening 
and the whether be it funds or um, be it institutions that are created to foster the arts. Fola Kunle Oshun, Fola Kunle, you have just arrived basically from Germany, is that correct? We were neighbors for a while. Um, that's what I said because I just came in from Vienna. Not literally neighbors, but um, Austria is the small country next to Germany that no one necessarily cares about. <laughs> but it's politically quite um, problematic, but that is, that's a whole other talk, so we won't go there. But um, yes, yeah, so you've just come in um, from uh, Potsdam in Brandenburg, where you are doing a residency. You are the first to receive the Curator in Residence grant from the City Council of Potsdam. Um, as we've already heard, uh, Fola Kunle is an artist curator based in Lagos. He balances his curatorial and artistic practices to create collaborative and interactive possibilities. His vision as a curator is to stage artistic interventions in cultural mind spaces, acting as a mediator between various parties in society. He's the founder of the Lagos Biennale and created the first edition themed Living on the Edge in 2017. So welcome. And Thank you for, the communi for communicating with us as well, little up here. Then I have the pleasure of introducing Bianca Amamenu, a Ghanaian-British curator, producer, and writer invested in, public and, uh, invested in public and performance art and photography. You can see her works here today, um, here today and tomorrow. Her recent partnerships include British Council Netherlands Embassy in Ghana, Sheffield International Documentary Festival, and her role as curator for Nubuke Foundation, an arts foundation in Accra. In 2016, Nubuke Foundation founded Ghana Must Go Forward, GMG, also known as GMG, a three-year initiative dedicated to investigating new ideas for progression in Ghana. GMG believes art, cross-disciplinary collaboration and creativity are integral to cultivating creative solutions to contemporary problems. You've just come in from Ghana, Bianca. Is this your first time in Lagos? Or have you been to Lagos? I've been before. Um, last year for Artex Lagos was the first welcoming and I've been between then again. So it's nice to be back for a third time. Great, welcome. The project uh, Ghana Must Go Forward, um, as I showed in the slides earlier, we're talking about reclaiming or claiming a narrative. I'm sure many of, uh, people in the audience, if not everybody, is familiar with the term Ghana Must Go and the historical implications in the politics of divide or division in Ghana and Nigeria's common history. Um, so what has redefining a narrative meant for you? Um, what uh, inspired you to choose this uh, title for the, for the project? And how do people react when they, hear the, when they hear the name or hear the title or read the title of the project? So Ghana Must Go Forward, or I should start with Ghana Must Go uh, with a colon, was initially developed by Nabuke Foundation, which is the art foundation I work for in Accra. And the Bouquet Foundation was founded in 2006 to preserve, promote, and record Ghanaian history, heritage, and culture. But in addition to that, they realized that there was a lack of infrastructure for artists, and 
so we also support the artistic practice of Ghanaian artists, young, early career and experienced. And that's why we have a booth here upstairs, for, uh, booth 11, so come through if you can. But the reason why Ghana Must Go was initially created, is, like you said, was to try and reclaim this historical understanding of Ghana Must Go, which came about in 1983, um, when President Shagari created, it was an exodus of my immigrants, in particular West Africans, and Ghanaians were heavily affected by it. Um, and it's been very, several decades since, and we wanted as a foundation, because this was developed before I joined the foundation, to look at what does this mean and what are historical phrases or movements, how, what do they mean now, what's our relevance? Especially because we're very um, keen and proactive about having living histories. So it was a conversation with the directors, um, Odile Tevi and Kofi Setoji, to look at what Ghana must go means within the Ghanaian context and how we could reclaim that. And by, uh, it's, there's been two other iterations of it, but this year in particular has been very powerful. It's a lot more proactive. And that's why I decided when I was programming and producing it to call it Ghana must go forward. It was about how can we come up with a verb that is powerful and pushes people to move um, in this direction. And also not just for the people we were inviting because Ghana must go forward is a program for 40 creatives of all types from farmers to architects, photographers, um, graphic designers, fashion designers, poets, writers, to get involved and think of creative ways to deal with contemporary problems in Ghana and looking at our infrastructural problems as well. So it made me responsible as a producer of it and it also made the applicants responsible. How are you going to engage in this? How are you going to be accountable? So that's what um, the Ghana Must Go Forward means in, in summary. And that's what this program has been for this year. So they were incubated, the 40 creators were incubated, incubated for three months and had a very intensive 12 week program of talks, film screenings, training, uh, residential trips, research, and many more as well. Thank you. We're going to go into that a bit more in in the meantime, we're jumping to space as a physical space, as a working space, and specifically the space of Lagos. Folakunle, what does Lagos mean as a working space to you? Why is it you want to work here? And we're part of creating a BNR in this space. Okay, um, that's a tricky one. Uh, Lagos is, is first of all, home for me. This is, um, I, I wasn't born here, I was born in Ibadan, but I uh, moved here when I was one. And it's a city you, you, you learn and you know. Like, I'll explain that with, with, with driving. I don't know how many people can speak Yoruba here. When you drive in Lagos, they say, or King Won, or Amon, or you don't look at the road, you cram where all the potholes are, you know exactly what route to pass, you know where the area boys are, you know where the last Maga is, you know where the... And for me, going to learn another city all over again with, with this at the back of my mind, how long will I use to learn New York or Dakar or wherever, I'm like, I have learned to subvert this space and make the dysfunction work for me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Probably the biennial was born out of that, you know, to say, hmm, there are empty buildings here. Um, um, there are people who are willing to open up their houses to artists from all over the world um, because we're just warm and caring people. And my, my theory of the city is that, you know, everybody gets paid somehow at the end of the day. Um, the people selling gala on the street are part of this ecosystem, you know, but because the city has this sort of appeal. I say Lagos has like, Lagos is a bigger brand than Nigeria or Africa. And you can try that on Google. Just Google Nigeria, you see Boko Haram. Google Lagos, you see, you know, high rise buildings in Lagos Island and it looks really cool. And because of that, um, we don't really examine or explore the, the different layers of the city that make the city work. And I'm really interested in that sort of like, ecosystem or architecture, like who are the people, who are the, the pillars that really make this very sort of 
I don't want to use the word bougie, but this really high class sort of elitist Lagos um, plateau work, what, what supports that structure? When we spoke earlier on, you talked of disrupting space and the need for art to be radical. Yeah. What does disrupting space mean for you? Um, for me, that is a bit part of my training or education as an artist and um, spending a lot of time learning and um, reading and um, having mentors from all over the world and you know, really wanting to understand my craft, like why, why am I doing this, why am I, why am I painting? There's, this, there's, a, there's a quote one of my mentors, B.C. Silva, used to say all the time, like, um, painting is dead, long live painting, like why am I trying to, to, to do stuff that has been done um, 500 years ago? Um, Renaissance painters were relevant to their, to their time, to their age, because they were expressly answering the question of that time. They were bringing to life Bible stories, mythologies, legends, and how do I become relevant to my own time? So um, disrupting this space is sort of like, in a sense, shaking the very, it's sort of like a placid, very like monotonous, predictable um, art ideal, you know, which is the, the root is quite obvious, which is like the educational system. And um, I gave this talk um, two years ago at the Tate Modern, and I took a book that has been used to teach art in Nigeria since I was born, since 1984. It's called Certificate Art by, um, I think, G. Ogumo. If you study art in Nigeria, um, one of the artists who came for the biennial last year, is a, his name is Jerry Buhari. He's a, a lecturer at the University of Zaria, and he said, that he banned that book in his master's class. It's a book for junior secondary schools. And you know, so you have tons of artists reading this. This is their introduction to what art is. You know, it's a nice painting of Bob Marley or Fela, and you know, this time around I make mine with bottle covers, or you know, I painted in a different way, or I did this. I'm like, I don't feel I am reflecting my time or my society with this sort of very Eurocentric. Um, ideal of making art. So disrupting on one side, on one hand, is the art form. On the other hand, it's like the dissemination of art. You know, like how the art is eventually going to be perceived, and what it can actually do to society, yeah, or in society. Yeah. It's, um, you said something interesting, reflecting the times and um, the function, for example, of painting. And I feel that art has um, art itself functions as an archive. Yeah. So when you create a piece, um, there is knowledge within that piece and there's information and it's automatically then stored. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the disruption of space, you also sort of have a form of documentation of that. So I thought, I just came to mind now was, um, within this. We're still here in the railway compound space and... Um, uh, if you could briefly say why you chose this space for the Biennale and um, yes, the title of this piece is Navigating a Dark Space. So I wonder how you navigated uh, accessing spaces and, and um, resources for, for the Biennale. In okay, so um, initially this wasn't the original space for the, for the Lagos Biennial. We, we thought of a central space that... Um, the art sort of audience will be able to access. And so we thought, you know, the National Museum was like sort of central. If you're coming from the Lagos mainland, it's mm -hmm. you know, not too far. Um, if you're coming from wherever on the island, VI, Koye, it's like quite accessible. And it's like a central place. It has like the whole um, pedigree of being like the National Museum. And so we, we, we got access to the space and they're going to give us the outdoor space. They, they said, you know, build whatever you want in this space. And so the idea was to recreate um, a refugee camp in this space. And we'd already chosen the theme, Living on the Edge, which was supposed to sort of catalog um, the experiences or the lives of people who are sort of eclipsed from the center of society. Mm -hmm. So we thought, you know, building a refugee camp might just work. So I wrote a letter to the UNHCR uh, in Switzerland and requested for 50 refugee tents, but we were so broke at the time that 
Um, we couldn't even do registered mail, it was just night post and they never responded to this email so we didn't get the refugee tents and the idea was to get 50 tents, get 50 artists to make installations in and around the tents and then at the end of the day donate the tents to um, the IDP camps in northeastern Nigeria. So that didn't work and just by happenstance I stumbled upon this space and it's, I mean I've lived in Yaba for about 15 years and I'd never been to this space and I don't know how I got there that day with my team and like, we have to see this space, this space is amazing and I saw the old locomotive trains and the guys there um, at uh, Legacy 1995, the conservative collective that take care of the space, they gave me a brief tour of the space and I was like, this is the space and like, the team was super upset because we spent so much time planning around the National Museum. But um, there's something I, I always told the team, like, like Lagos does not need a biennial. Lagos is a biennial by itself. This space is a biennial. People live in these trains. It's, it's impossible to understand how they survive in this place. So navigating that darkness, you know, what is dark to you, somebody else's light. And I just think that's like the Lagos story. Yes, it's a very haunting space at, at the same time. It's very yeah. powerful. Yeah. Bianca, I'd like to, uh, to show this trailer. You can tell us a bit about the trailer. This trailer was taken on our opening night um, where we invited the 40 applicants that were selected. There were actually uh, 64 applicants who applied for Ghana Moscow Forward and we decided to celebrate them, the 40 that were selected, by having a launch um, event which we hosted at a location called Base Camp Initiative. So Last year when we had Ghana Moscow Forward, we hosted it at the foundation, but we're currently undergoing renovation to reopen with a purpose-built exhibition space for the arts, which gave us a perfect opportunity to collaborate with other art spaces that were emerging in Accra, and also to really look at what does Ghana Moscow Forward means, how does that manifest in a physical sense, and that's what Basecamp uh, Initiative is. So Basecamp Initiative is an outdoor co-working space. It is fully equipped with Wi-Fi, seating and everything, but it's outdoors, which is which is really refreshing to have. So that trailer was showing you kind of the beginning of the program, which started on August the 3rd, and we've come a long way since then. It finished last week, and it culminated with a trip to Wa in the Upper West region of Ghana. And we took um, 18 creatives that were within um, Ghana Must Go Forward to think about reinventing design and reviving artisanal practices like weaving, because the foundation has a center in the Upper West region that's dedicated to textiles and ceramics. And that trip was pretty life-changing for a lot of the members, because I think in the same way that when you live in Lagos or you have, um, you've had your upbringing, you forget how insular you become, and that becomes your reference point, and you forget that it's not necessarily the same around the country. Mm -hmm. And going to Wa is completely different from Accra as a city. It's almost like you're going, actually I've just seen someone here, there's two people here who are part of Ghana Must Go Forward and one of our members is there at the back, Sandy, sorry Sandy, I know you said I shouldn't do this but I'm doing it anyway. Um, she's part of Ghana Must Go Forward, she's great. Sandy runs uh, a program initiative which is about training young Ghanaian men and women, anyone who wants to skate or surf in Ghana. So it's about having reviving tourism in Ghana and also thinking about creating jobs and employment, looking at the environment because you're engaging on beaches. So that's Sandy's initiative in addition to doing many other things and working for Konobi. She's just one of the many types of people we have. So she came with us to Wa last week, last week and 
as I said, it was life-changing because many people haven't left Accra, maybe because they're busy working and focusing in the city, or maybe because they can't afford it. Some of the members that we have, uh, we have one guy in particular, he's very, very talented. He's a um, user, um, a UI uh, designer, so he does about user experience and technology, but he's been unemployed for the last five years because he can't find the right kinds of companies that will cater to his needs, so he hasn't been able to travel. So we had him and a few other members who use the opportunity of going to WA as seeing another perspective and it was very humbling for them. And also thinking about some of the industries that we have because there's a real shift at the moment happening in Ghana of, I call it communal to capital. You have this tension of people having always existed together and supporting each other and having artisanal practices like farmers or weavers or ceramicists. And so you exist in this environment which is very protected and it's being faced with this clash of you know, globalization and, and as a result, people, there's a demand, there's capitalism, and people can't necessarily meet that. So to bring the members of Ghana Must Go Forward who are engaging in this very contemporary um, digital world and of working as freelancers and are in this free market to going to somewhere like WA, which is not that at all. People don't care if they, you know, they'll be making fabric and then someone will die and everyone, all of the 60 weavers will stop to go to a funeral for three months and no, fa no fabric is made and you can't get any fabric. So to give people another way of looking at value systems was really... Um, effective as well. How do you access people who are in such a different world in a sense from, from a crowd? Because you, that's one thing I find interesting about your project. You have people from all different backgrounds. Um, you have people who have degrees, people who don't have degrees. As you mentioned, farmers, um, cultural producers, writers. How are you able to um, reach people? I think that's a really good question and it is at the heart of the foundation, which is First of all, self-awareness in order to engage with different types of people and knowing your position. And even mine, because I used to live, although I'm Ghanaian very much, proudly so, I have spent the majority of my life in England. So I'm aware of my limitations and my blind spots and the fact that I can't always relate to um, a Ghanaian context or things will go over my head. I think I've done very well to adapt. <laughs> and I, 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 but I'm also aware that I'm constantly code switching and shifting between these different identities. And... Um, to answer the question of how you relate to different people is partly ingrained in the culture, in Ghanaian culture, but also lifestyle. So for instance, I live with my grandmother intentionally because there's something about constantly being reminded of a perspective and a way of thinking that is, you know, 50 years more above mine that I wouldn't get if I came here, which I initially did, had my own place, rented it, and engaged with the majority of my demographic. There's certain rules I've learned about hierarchy and culture and tradition, which have really been helpful. So even with the foundation, in order to relate to different types of people, it's also about the ability to have self-awareness, the introspection of seeing yourself. But fundamentally, there is a shared, regardless of people's backgrounds or their credentials, we do have shared things. Fundamentally, everyone wants self-validation and they want to be heard and they want you to give them the time and the patience. And I think that's something that allows us to create this connectivity between all of the different members of Ghana Must Go Forward. Because once you can, you have the empathy to understand what someone is saying to you, which is very big in Ghanaian culture anyway, then you should be able to relate to them. You'll find some kind of tangent. And I think that's why the foundation has been successful in attracting such a range of different demographics, um, personalities and characteristics, which are reflected in Ghana Must Go Forward as well. And that translates in the spirit of the foundation as well and in the work because, I mean, for example, within the space that I move in, in Europe, in Austria, I find there are many blind spots when events are created um, for less privileged people to have access. So um, if that's a spirit that um, can carry through also and through the work, I feel um, from what I've also seen in Lagos that, it's, that one is able more to um, find accessibility for, for different people that different people have roles then. Um, area boys were mentioned earlier, for example, utilizing their knowledge in building up a space, for example, and um, engaging people and making them feel like they're part of something, but also re respecting their own um, levels of interaction and the way they go about things. And um, yeah, so, Yes, yeah, so it's a chance to also break division then, isn't it? Because um, also classism, um, 
art, art spaces can be very classist spaces also because those who create often aren't those who can um, move within spaces where art is purchased. Or, so these are quite quite big topics. I just wanted to add to that as well that you know you mentioned you made a comment earlier about um, about exchanges and divisions. The other thing that really makes it easy to relate to people is appreciating that. And I think I was aware of this anyway, but the foundation really emphasized it for me is that every single person you meet has some kind of information that you do not know. It might be where you go to buy really good porridge in the morning from, you know, Auntie Hadja. Like, I've learned so many random facts about things that I would never know because, because of the lack of infrastructure in Ghana, information isn't centralized or collected in that way. So you have to be reliant on the power of individual, the, the knowledge that people have. And it could just be one conversation with someone that you meet and it turns out that they can do this, this and that. And that's the beauty of living in Ghana is, you know, you'll never ever know that you can get um, really good quality cotton yarns that are hand dyed and the indigo is sourced within Ghana. You'd never know that mm -hmm. unless you go to the market and you engage with this woman who tells you about her son who happens to do that. It's these stories that make you, remind you to be humble and to keep exploring and being curious and changing the way that you live your life and never getting too comfortable. You know, Because once you do, then you forget that there's other ways of engaging with different types of people. Um, yeah, just... Beautifully said, yeah. Um, just to round off, the, what does working in Ghana mean for you? Because you said you're also um, based in the UK. So not only your sort of your personal connection, family-wise, and how you um, connect, but uh, your work, or if you compare to um, accessibility in, in the maybe what is known as more a sort of a privileged space in the UK to um, spaces that are more marginalized or, you know... Uh, I think as of the end of the, as of now, maybe I should say, um, I'm definitely, I live in Ghana now, like I've made that decision, that's where I want to be and that's where I will be. And in terms of going between Ghana and England, I acknowledge that that's my history and it's very advantageous and, you know, it's benefiting the foundation and it also benefits the work that I do. So... I have certain contracts that are still in the UK, for instance, the International Documentary Festival that I work for as a, as a producer for. The fact that I work as a producer for this documentary festival means that I was able to source incredible documentaries that have been seen and won awards all around the world and screen them in Ghana for Ghana Must Go Forward for an audi a local audience. And that is brilliant. So I don't, uh, and this is me anyway, I don't see a separation between the spaces, mm -hmm. it's more about the function and how I'm interacting with them. Um, yeah, and I try and, and stay away from that. It's more of a circle for me as opposed to uh, contrasting of going between England and, and Ghana because I definitely am both and sometimes more than I like of one or of another but they're, they're both within me and muddled up. So. Thank you. I have a question for you both. So the same question for both of you. Um, how do you navigate your own roles? Because um, you uh, act as curators and artists and as creatives running our own projects, we often take up different positions. We build the structure of a project, have the ideas, but often execute on many levels. So how do you maneuver that? Because I feel um, that that is something that happens sometimes due to lack of resources as well. Um, even if it's just bo um, bodies on ground or uh, lack of access to, to financial resources. Um, how do you maneuver that? And one more question, if, um, if you'll allow, is how, how does it affect your craft as creatives when you have to do that? Or does it? Do you want to go first? Okay. Um, I've always been an artist, and my entry into the curatorial field was like really accidental, and I'm not sure I take it serious enough because there's a very fine line where it's quite comfortable and you can have the best of both worlds, and I'm learning to really work it. So after my first degree in, in visual arts, majoring in sculpture, I thought, you know, like maybe five years down the line, I should do uh, an MFA at the University of Lagos, and... 
uh, so I registered, paid my fees, and then found out there was no professor to take me in sculpture. And my professor, Pejulai Wala, was willing to take me in art history. And it was quite intense because I was just coming there to carve wood and, you know, pound mortar, but it was this whole, like, she was just reading and reading and reading and reading. And we had, like, a really great bond. She would give me really huge books to just take home and, and, and study. And, and, and then I, I started to work with galleries and started to find my own voice at some point. So it's, um, it's, it's been a journey, but I don't think it's, it's like cast in stone. You know, like an artist should make art and a curator should contextualize or present art or make exhibitions or whatever. I, I think um, even that artistic freedom, your artistic license is to be whatever you want to be. Uh, Jalil Atiku is running for president, not, you know, and it, it seems like, like a joke, you know, when it was a performance piece, but... At some point, I actually took him seriously because I've seen him do insane things. And I was like, is, is this guy really serious? And, you know, so I, I think if I wasn't an artist or a curator, I would be a freedom fighter or something. I would be that guy carrying a placard who would probably be shot. But this is my own way of sort of um, uh, creating institutions, creating platforms where I can say the exact things I would want to say, uh, you know, marching, uh, but probably in a subtler way, I probably won't get arrested. I'm still doing a lot of self-critique and self-censorship that, you know, isn't this just too cool? Am I really making any impact with, you know, with all of this, you know, because curating was supposed to be that way out where I would have a bigger voice and be able to do more and, and, and yeah, and, and say more, but, I don't think you know I've hit that that place yet. I, I think um, it has to be a whole lot more radical, and um, it, it, at, at the end of the day, it, it might be on the same level with carrying a placard. Like if we really had to make change with art, because um, th there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of talk, you know, about oh, this could be this and that could be that and. You know, historically, this was this, and that's why this is this. And you know, I'm always with the biennial trying to say why Lagos is what it is. You know, considering its historical context, and it's pretty easy to be super convincing with this sort of uh, arguments or building these narratives. But but at the end of the day, who really cares about like who in society who hasn't had um, one square meal cares about what you're saying? How do you really make change? So I mean. Venturing into curating was a frustration with my art, you know, and before biennial or anything, it was converting my studio space in Yaba into a proper gallery or an art space, and I just in building this space it was quite a huge space, and I got all my tools, my brushes, spatulas, everything, chisels, and nailed them into the ceiling. Like I want to understand what this whole art thing is about. I want to know why I'm making art. And these materials, these tools seem to be a distraction because I'm becoming a machine, producing things that people will hang in their rooms and it's, it's really not having any impact on, on society because before I ever studied art, I studied economics for two years because I wanted to save the world and understand market structures, why do people make certain decisions, why is there so much poverty in the world? And I ended up just studying mathematics. So. Art was the getaway to really save the world and change the world, and then it became this bourgeois thing where we're all drinking red wine, and I'm like, nah, this is no way. You know, so curating is like, and this and curating is even sexier than art, and so you're like going around in circles and really not making an impact. So I'm at a point where I really want to recoil and like, how do we like really shake tables and and say stuff and really make that impact that can can a forum like this dictate who will become the next president of Nigeria? I wish, yeah. I really enjoyed you explaining your process because I felt a little bit like you were in um, the same restlessness that you have and this constant, constant self-interrogation. You're asking yourself these questions means that did I necessarily actively choose to become a curator or was it something that I felt was 
a necessary name to give to what I was already doing and questioning. So for me, I have always been a writer. I've always written. I've always had this urgent need to articulate what is it, like you said, this in self-interrogation and trying to understand and relate to things and understand why things are like this and why is this and also being aware of this ability to relate to people and understand their perspective and having empathy, but also being able to be... Um, very objective and stand back, I thought this is a skill that I have that I want to utilize in the best possible way. And for me, it was more, there was this sudden moment where it was like r realizing that art is a tool, that if it's, it's very insidious and if it's done very well, you can completely change the way that someone thinks. And actually, just to make a quick reference, the Trump is a good example of that, because you can see in the curation of the media around him, he's had a whole, he's had years ahead of creating this image, which meant that when it came to him presenting himself, it put him in a completely powerful position. And I think we also shouldn't underestimate the impact of, of media as a tool that is, can be beautifully um, curated to convince people do people want, do you want the truth or do you want something beautiful? And I think that phrase lends itself so well to art because it's about how you can make someone believe in something. That's actually what it's about for me. That's why I'm interested and, and why I engage with visual arts and, and performance and photography art as a medium because it's about making someone believe in something. And if you're very careful with that tool, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and so whether that means writing or using programs or supporting artists, and particularly being in Ghana, I realized, or it dawned on me even more that I do not have the luxury of engaging in art purely for aesthetic reasons. If it's not being used to communicate some kind of political message, if I'm not doing that, then what am I doing here? Like, what, what's the point of all of this? As you said, is it just for, you know, to, to engage in conversation, bourgeoisie and frivolous conversations? Is this what we've really come here for? At least not for me anyway. So curating is something that came to me secondary and I think I was quite resistant to it because I've always written. I think I've also always taken it for granted. And I, in the same way that you don't see it in a linear way, I have... Being the, I'm the kind of person who, yes, I write, but I'm also very high functioning and can get things done very quickly. So I was writing, but then I was, at one point I was training to become an astronomer, which is very random. And then I was at drama school, and these are all me, all existing at the same time. So there's so many sides, and that's why I don't see things in you know, contrast. It's all a circle, because everything is interlinked. And, but this political need, or realizing the advantage of being smart with art and how you engage with it really pulled me. And so that's why um, I am curating at the moment and it's shifting, but I still write very much. In fact, since I moved to Ghana, I've been writing even more. It's, it's incessant, like in the middle of the night, I'm writing for hours and just all of the feeling almost like I am a, a, a megaphone or a channel that wants to communicate all of these observations and also really appreciating the fact that I, that like I mentioned earlier, this ability to see lots of different perspectives and um, looking at characteristics and that's why Ghana Must Go Forward has been created in the way that it was created because I felt like I had this insight and perspective that maybe people also feel but haven't been able to articulate and that's what that's how you relate to different types of people it's about finding a way of articulating something that we all share but for some reason we can't say it um, so I think yeah that's that's why I have I'm curate, I am curating and have been and enjoy it very much, but also writing and doing many things that have evolved as a result and trying to bring different art forms together because actually it's not, and this isn't to undermine the value of the arts, um, the art, artistic mediums that I engage with, it's actually, it's not really necessarily about the medium, it's about the bigger goal and communicating that. And if it means, and that's why Ghana Must Go Forward works, it's because it was about an experiment to see what happens when you bring completely different perspectives from one, you know, from a producer of the art to a consumer of the art, from a maker to someone who's very critical. And we even had an accountant in the program because they were interested in looking at what, how they could be challenged creatively. And also because of the lack of infrastructure, lack, lack of funding for a lot of artists, it made sense to have accountants involved in the programs or people who had financial backgrounds. 
um, yeah, it's about communicating a bigger message and making it, it, it sustainable, really. And then you're creating different positions for people to be involved from different fields, once again, bringing people together. Thank you. Thank you, ArtX, that I was able to meet these people. I just wanted to say that as a side note, because I'm really enjoying um, myself so far. And back to archives. And um, once again, something you mentioned in conversation, you talked about mental archives to work with as physical archives have been abandoned. Um, unfortunately, um, often physical, the actual physical archives are destroyed or burned um, and we don't have access to certain um, piece, pieces of artwork, be it, or um, films, for example, a lot of films from the 70s, great documentaries that simply don't exist. Um, sometimes there's just not the awareness also of the importance of archives. So what could be a solution? And just briefly, just a... a a solution to maintaining some sort of archive because um, all the work that you're doing, um, it's important, it's powerful, but how can uh, we still sort of look back at it um, or look back onto it in years to come or dig a bit deeper also and look at what was there before? Um, I, think, I think like in the 21st century, the question of archiving, like you're making new work is, is straightforward. There's, in the digital age, it's it's the easiest thing to like just store it on a hard drive or something. Um, but when I talk about mental archives, it's going into the past to retrace your historical trajectories, and you really can't find um, a lot of material because they've either been burnt down or stolen or just just disappeared for some reason. And um, and then you begin to get smart and figure out. Like you know, this is a society that traditionally, historically, is based on like oral tradition, and um, certain values and information have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And you know, like she said much earlier, there are people in your hood who just know stuff. And so you know, back to the, the previous question, which was like this artist curator thing. I've had to come out of my hermit artist self to actually engage people that, you know, normally I'm feeling like this genius who can make stuff, but I'm just regurgitating stuff without being informed. And so now as an artist, I'm, I'm going, you know, around the whole place and getting information and this is informing whatever work I'm making or whatever project I'm, I'm working on. So um, mental archives, not just as holding things in your mind, but actually uh, communicating with people, yeah. And also shifting from the typical sort of Eurocentric approach to these things. Because if you look at oral history, for example, something yeah. that is specifically African approach yeah, yeah, yeah. of um, passing on knowledge, yeah, yeah. history. Yeah. Click, kitty click. Okay, sorry, that was too fast. That is still um, within the railway compound. Okay. I'll let you look at that just for a little while before it goes to the next um, slide. Bianca, who is this? That is a really <laughs> good question. Who is Anas? I don't even know if I know that answer. Does anyone, does does anyone anybody know who this know? is? Does anybody know who this is? How do I even start this story? Keyword investigative journalism. That's all I know. So, as I mentioned, when developing Ghana Must Go Forward, um, the name was also about challenging me and holding me accountable. So I come up with this program. The program for Ghana Must Go Forward, the whole concept was developed um, about 11 months before it was initially launched. So every single, the three month program, every single week was planned well in advance. And in the programming, I put I mean, I, the, I just thought I'm going to do everything that I think is possible, regardless of whether it's feasible. So I put in the program that we would have a luminary talk with Anas Aremnia Anas, who is a uh, investigative journalist in Ghana, and he's probably one of the most 
um, contentious and also infamous investigative journalist because he's masked, masked and he does a lot of um, investigative pieces about child trafficking and exposes um, corruption, not just in Ghana, but in, in, internationally. So anyway, I put his name on the program and uh, presented it to the directors and they said, this, just to correct, is that, does that say Anas is going to be engaged in this program? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, it means Anas is going to be involved. And I said, oh, so do you know him? It's like, uh, not yet, but I'll find a way. Which is incredibly difficult, finding one of the most wanted uh, men in Ghana who has no visible identity and wears a mask to try and get them to engage in a program. But as always, there is a way, and I am relentless. So I, as you know, you never know who there is. There's always someone. I, um, long story short, put out a few leads and something came back, got a message back. So it escalates very quickly. He only does about two public appearances a year. And it's uh, very, the level of security and planning that needs to go into having Anna speak at a session is, is, is difficult. He has about four decoys who come and you don't know who's there and they're all masked. So he's in a room with all of these decoys. So long story short, Anas agrees and then also says to me, I will do it, but on the condition that you screen this documentary that was made in 2015 and has only been shown once in Ghana at the Canadian Embassy. So I think, okay, I don't know if this is possible. Send a message to the production company and the embassy and they agree to our screening the film. So everything steps up. And then he also says, if I'm going to do this, it cannot be just for, the Ghana Must Go Forward members are 40 people. But because he only does two public um, appearances a year in the world, he said it needs to be more people to make it worth him coming out. And he asked for a minimum of 100 people in attendance. Um, so I said, okay, let's make that happen. And we put a private call out and had an invitation. But anyway, so we have, Anas comes through, we have the event. Um, there's a lot of security that went into that event. And also not just that, because of the level of people who came through, we had about seven diplomats out of 70 people there. Um, and to secure everyone in an outdoor co-working space, you can imagine what the risk assessment and planning was for something like that. So he comes along and he agrees. And it completely, there were so many highlights in Ghana Must Go Forward. But it was great to have him there because, first of all, it made, it gave people an opportunity to see that um, resisting and being critical of what, is exist, what exists or infrastructures that seem as if they're untouchable is very attainable and it's very real. And he talked about his ingenious methods of subterfuge and the fact that he hides his identity and he uses a lot of prosthetics when he investigates, investigates stories to get information about um, you know, the trafficking of children or the fact that uh, albino uh, individuals are fetishized and kidnapped and you know, their body parts are sold. Very dark stories, but he's covering them. Mm -hmm. So having someone like him involved in the program it was already political, but made it very clear that we were being completely, um, it was about focusing on it being about critical thinking, and if the, as a result of it, if it's political, then so be it. So that's what that, that now Nas was part of our program, and he was one of many highlights in 12 weeks of programming. So we had three events a week, two private for the Ghana Must Go Forward members, which was a workshop, intensive workshop, and uh, intimate, Study, like sessions, and then we had one public event where we opened it up to the general public as well, which is what this featured in. Yeah. Thank you. Because we, because the topic is we are own son, I want to actually change. I wanted to ask you how your how your work is viewed in Germany, but then I thought that might be a contradiction of looking at us as our own son if we once again look at um, what a Eurocentric view on your work is, but I can't um, uh, ignore the fact that when we think about or look at um, where African art is exhibited, then the majority of African artwork is not on the continent. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, most of it is exhibited in, in, in the West and um, in um, museums and um, in galleries, etc. Um, and, and also carry a sort of a bloody history of um, enslavement and um, colonization of how these uh, pieces were stolen and also taken out of context and then um, removed of their meaning to a certain extent. And when we look at this um, 
form of exhibition. We're not just talking about art pieces, we're talking also about human beings being presented. So this whole history of exhibiting um, in, a, in, a, in a European or in a, um, a Western context is, is connected to oppression. So, um, so my question is uh, how, still how you navigate that space um, Because we, we, when we, it was this question of what the hell am I doing in, in the in the natural history museum? I just, I mean, that for example, this, um, um, the, the really then realizing where am I? Why am I here? What am I doing here? What, um, and that then brings us back to uh, us being our own son because you're there, and then you're like, why am I here in the space? Where do I start from? The residency or the Natural History Museum? <laughs> um, okay, so um, I've, I've been on a one-year residency with the city council in Potsdam in the state of Brandenburg in Germany and um, it was um, the first edition, first time they'll ever have it because Potsdam is like 40 minutes by train from Berlin and they're always sort of in the shadow of Berlin so it was for the first time the government wanted to show that you know they were sort of inclusive and had the whole diversity thing going on. So um, they shortlisted about 15 curators, and I was like the only person from Africa. And, uh, I was selected to be on this one-year thing, and getting there, I just—I mean, I already knew that there were there were a lot of like stereotypes and expectations, which drives me crazy. And you know, the, this African person, there's there's a sort of methodology and the way that they expect you to work. And even before this, two years ago, I was shortlisted for something similar. And this is like on a side story. There are these two really old German men who were interviewing me. I was like first three to be selected for this curatorial residence somewhere in southern Germany, different place. And the first thing they would say after exchanging pleasantries, or first thing they would do was to bring up a picture of Okuya Wenzo. And they were like, do you know this man? And I was like, yeah, but you know, what does that mean? But that's, so it was like, we're gonna bring somebody from Africa to show that you know, we are inclusive and if one Nigerian has done it, they probably produce the finest curators, this guy. And I've, I've gone there, and I think in, in Potsdam, it's, it's, it's totally flipping the entire script and working sort of in reverse. In my project has been, um, meeting strangers on the streets, uh, um, it's been f like full-on social engagement and uh, making acquaintances with them and eventually making a film documentary which has to do with uh, going to their houses and having them host me in, in a dinner and talk about uh, the city in the context of its, its history and how that reflects on, on, on contemporary life in the city. And so I, I always have like a, a production crew with me going for these things. And um, it's, it's totally sort of unorthodox for them, which for me is the most normal thing to go to my friend's house to have food in the evening. You know, so I'm, I'm sort of shining that sun or that light on them and say, you know, life could be different. And there's so many experiences that I probably can't even like everything here. Like people breaking down and crying because you know, it's such a conservative society. Their only friend in life is probably a dog or a cat. And here's this guy who's really yeah. been open with them and making like real friends with these people. And um, yeah. yeah, it's just trying to break that stereotype that um, I'm not the person that you trained. I'm not like I haven't ingested this training, and I'm not coming to regurgitate it to you in some form of post-modernist African sort of sentiment that you still think we are caught up in. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I was having a sort of uh, argument conversation with friends a few weeks ago saying that I am not black, and they're like, yeah, you're, you're OJ, right? I'm, like, no, I'm not OJ, I'm complicated. <laughs> like, like, they're different. I mean, look at this. This, this is black. Like, I cannot be black in a country where I'm majority, like yeah, if, if you were in South Africa and you were white, you could be a white South African, you know, that's great. But how then are you a black South African in your own country? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's saying these bold statements and saying, hey, like I have my own life. I come from somewhere. 
no, I don't want to extend my stay after the residency. I'm going home. I have my Lagos where I can have jollof rice either in Shita or in Bogobiri or anywhere, and it's fine, you know. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a lot about respect, you know, and dignity and educating people that there's a world out there. You know, and people have their own ways of sorting out their own issues and living their lives and, you know, just being happy. Yeah. So you're focusing on Lagos now and creating this, your work here. Um, sustainability. Bianca, um, the project, from what I gather, runs for three years. So what happens after these three years? Because um, you're creating a, a base for so many people. They're relying on that. And how, how are you going to be able to maintain... What, what happens after the three years pass in the project? That's a very good question. I've been asking myself, because it finished last week, and I have about 30 of the Ghana Must Go Forward members messaging me almost daily saying, what's next? I said, go and live your lives. That's what happens next. <laughs> so I can have a break, because I'm tired. <laughs> But aside from that, <laughs> is so there was this moment in Wa where, as Sandra will know this, everyone started calling me Auntie B. <laughs> because, so you know, you have to make sure you have to create an environment for people and make sure everyone's very comfortable. And I would do the like the dinner orders in the evening. And one, when we got back, people were messaging me, like, oh, no one's going to ask me today what I'm having for dinner. <laughs> and order the food but there was one moment in while where I think I had to I had to do something so I wasn't there for the day and I didn't see the group I didn't see the uh, 16 Ghana must go forward members who were doing the workshops and they I came in the evening and joined everyone for dinner and I said oh how did it go we always have a check-in so we have about an hour before we have dinner together where we check in and plan the next day and what's going to happen and for the first time, I didn't have to facilitate. I didn't have to intervene. Everyone had come up with thinking about planning a festival in Wa, so we can bring, we can join up, um, you know, commercial retailers or merchants in, in Accra in the city with weavers in Wa, and also exporting this tourism that's always very much in the city to bringing it to Wa. We had people talking about that. We had people talking about how can you, some of the engineers on the team, how can you refine how a loom is made so that it's more efficient and you can make more fabric, um, but also without corrupting the system that exists, the ecosystem, and not taking it from the people in Wa. And I think I did say at the end, after being quiet for a while, that I was, this is exactly what the program is about. The fact that you don't have to be reliant on my input and my um, stimulus for you to do this. This is your own and remember it and move it forward. And that's exactly what Ghana Must Go Forward is about. Now, what happens next? Um, you know, when you put something out sometimes and it manifests, you don't necessarily think about, you know, at least with me and maybe there's a certain naivety, I know it will exist because it has to, because I want it to. And I'm quite stubborn like that. So it's gonna happen, so it will, and there'll be a way. And the foundation have been incredibly receptive and supportive of Ghana Must Go Forward and wanted to continue. So now is taking a bit of a rest and a breather, catching up and then planning another iteration for the next year and many more years to come, I hope. But for now, it's done what was intended when I uh, came up you know, with the programming a year ago and I look forward to it developing because there's a real critical mass now that the foundation has of these 40 creatives who want to keep doing things in this, in this light. So if I could just step in, sorry. Okay. We have about 10 more minutes for the talk, but in this time, if you guys have questions, please write down your questions. And if anybody's on social media, if you could write your questions in, in the comment box, that would be really great. Just to say very quickly, so this is from, we had a whole week call of design thinking, which is um, very much, it's about user experience. It's a very, a contemporary way of thinking about design, looking at empathy and the process of creating that has emerged as a result of, uh, I'd say, social media, graphic design, and it completely contrasts with older methods. So we have Kofi Sesoji, who is an artist for Nobuke Foundation, and his philosophy for art is very much about a lived experience. He lives his life, therefore it impacts how he designs and how he thinks, whereas design thinking is far more academic and almost quite rigid 
uh, very method um, there's a real method to understanding design and this was about bridging the gap between design thinking and also understanding how a normal weaver who doesn't do design thinking and just lives their lives creates fabric or weaves um, So that's Kofi Satoji, our artistic director. We often talk about how individual our respective contexts are in terms of being unique. You know, there's no place like Lagos, there's no place like Accra. Um, the art scenes tell their own specific stories. Uh, however, do you think a pan-African approach or approaches and strategies are possible um, when it comes to looking at funding, for example, of the arts or sustainability? Because if we're talking about um, being our own son, then these ties um, could be an advantage. And also, um, could it be possible to then uh, step away from Western initiatives, funding and power? if there is a stronger Pan-African tie, or is it as in many areas or all areas to do with African relations that um, there is the Western influence or an influence from outside that creates a dependency? Um, I'm gonna, I, <laughs> I, I've, I have some uh, thoughts about this because before this I've been thinking about it anyway and I think it's a nice way to bridge the gap between Ghana Must Go Forward and why Nobuke Foundation are here at the fair. So Ghana Must Go Forward is funded predominantly by the British Council and you can imagine it's slightly, well, it's slightly contentious having a program called Ghana Must Go Forward that's predominantly funded by the British Council um, and I am very aware of that, and I'm also aware of the fact that one of the reasons I was able to secure that funding is because of my position and the fact that I've grown up in the UK and I've worked for the British Council at certain points as a, as a, as a writer, I've contributed to them. So it's also about knowing that position that I have and I can switch between you know, being both British and Ghanaian, but also knowing how difficult it is to get funding in Ghana for a program. And unfortunately, sometimes the fact that it's been funded externally makes it valid for them, for me to then get funding in Ghana. So there's real problems there. Moving forward, I have spoken to certain sponsors who are willing to invest in the program. Um, but although it was funded by the British Council, it was really imperative to make sure every aspect of the program was pan-African and it was reflected, whether it was the talks or the trips or the references that were used. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is other active ways of making sure it's pan-African is that the reason why Nabuke Foundation is present at Artex Lagos is because we're looking at alternative models of fundraising. So our method for being at the fair is we don't operate in the same sense as a commercial gallery. We come and even before we get here, the artists that we're working with, some are emerging, some are more experienced, have had development throughout this process, how they present their work, visiting their studios at least twice a week, talking through their process, looking at their materials, thinking about how they can change their form, and preparing them to show them in a commercial space. And in addition to that, the percentage that the artists take from the fair when their works are sold are much higher than most commercial galleries. And the percentage that the foundation takes goes to developing the next round of artists we'd bring to the fair and also to other educational programs. So that for us is so important as an alternative means of, um, of, of funding in a pan-African sense. And you don't get that any more than coming to an art fair where you're predominantly surrounded by African collectors and asking them to invest in talent, not just in the product that they're, you know, in not product, sorry, the artwork that they're purchasing, but the fact that it has a longer term implication for another generation of artists and for the foundation as well. And we intentionally price our works in dollars because of the fact that when it's converted in Ghana, the, um, it can go much further, so it can have so much more impact than it would have, uh, you know, for that reason. So please come to booth 11 upstairs. Nobuke Foundation is on the right. I'll see you there <laughs> today and tomorrow.
The closing question for you both. What is your message for young artists in Africa or those wishing to follow the path of artistic practice and cultural production? Yeah, so this is... Sorry, also in terms of access to... Um, access, um, I mean, funding. I probably will, will take it Sorry. from where she dropped it and then dive into this. And I, I probably have a different like perspective and orientation to funding, which is uh, if you really have to do it, you know, you'll get it done. And um, yeah, funding means that um, there's probably who somebody who is watching you and um, could probably co-opt your narrative and uh, you definitely will have to make some levels of, of compromise. So for me, whatever I do, whether it's a biennial, you know, I sort of count the cost, like how much am I ready to give away with this? And that has to be balanced with how much I think the public will benefit from whatever I'm giving. So it's trying to find an equilibrium with that. Um, and when you see young artists across Africa, it also feeds into this whole Pan-African thing. And not that I don't believe in like Pan-Africanism, but um, I haven't traveled so much across Africa. I've traveled almost every country in West Africa. And two months ago, I was in, in South Africa, Johannesburg, and it was the most mind-boggling, traumatic experience of my life. Like, you, you hear about all these countries and you think, you know, we're all Africans, we're all the same. Yeah, we're all Africans. Yes, we're probably all black-skinned. But it was, it, was, it was a different, like, it was, I couldn't, I had no reference to this. It was the, the culture, the way of life, the thinking, the prejudice that existed there. And, you know, just, I wouldn't know what to say to an artist operating in that context. You know, I probably have something general to say to any artist in the world, whether they're in Russia or Hong Kong or wherever, which is, I mean, like a young emerging artist, um, and this is like really personal, stop whatever you're doing, you know. Most people will tell you, you know, just keep at it, keep pressing one day, it's gonna, just stop what you're doing and, and try to figure out why you're doing it. You know, you probably have to take a course in something or read more of something, and really, you know, that's like, to any young artist who comes up to me, just stop, just stop painting, just stop that, stop, just stop it, and <laughs> figure out the why, yeah. Okay. Just one sentence from Bianca. Just do you can you um, say one sentence of what you would like to say to a young artist, just as quick as you can. Yeah. So. No, I I looked away because you summed it up. Yeah. Okay. Why? If you don't know, if you don't ask yourself that question, then what are you doing? I think that's okay. that's it. Ask yourself why. Okay, we have a question from the... You, you don't have to ask it right now. Give yourself some time. You can do it later. It's yes. okay. <laughs> but it's nice that there's, they're so eager, right? The question I have is, if I stumble a little bit on a handwriting, will somebody will give, will help me out? How do collectors help to strengthen the art ecosystem at home? as well as help to promote African art to the world from an African perspective or with an African-led narrative? I don't know if um, collectors are the right people to um, hold responsible to help advance the arts. I think they are part of the ecosystem and they they um, play their role. But talking about Africa, I'm not sure we value art enough yet to place the kind of, like, like if, if, if the art commands um, the kind of amount that could really change anything. Um, speaking from a Nigerian perspective, um, I mean, you hear like, an artist sold a piece of art for two million naira, and you're like, whoa, like, convert that money to dollars or euros and travel abroad and it's nothing, you know, and you, 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 you wonder why an artist is on the same level for five, ten years because they're really not feeding on any new information or any new material or substance because um, there's really no funding to promote institutions that can actually help develop them 
and the money they get is just for subsistence. So um, if, if collectors were to have probably a more philanthropic approach, maybe, but with the current uh, market value of art on the continent, I'm, I'm very pessimistic about that. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have a slightly different approach. The first one is to say that, so it, it's for me, and this is something I learned in Ghana, it's not that, at least I'll speak for myself, it's not that art doesn't have value, it has a different, it's not that it's not appreciated. So in Ghana, what I realized is that art has existed because it's always had a function. So even the quality of the art that you see depends on how you're defining it. I've had to really broaden that term, has changed. For instance, if you look at the stools within the Ashanti kingdom and their level of detail and attention in that is because of the cultural significance of that work. If you look at the kente that the Ever people will make or their cloth, again, it's because of the culture. It's a way of archiving the history one moment in time, a ceremony or a tradition, you want to mark it in the best possible way. Now that has been art. This philosophy or approach of contemporary art, it's very, it's quite foreign to see it in that way. So what you might find is you might see a, a, um, a shanti stool with an Dinkra symbol, which is worth you know, millions if you want to price it in an international context or looking, if you want to use that mark of looking at dollars or international currencies, then you'll know that the British count, you know, British Museum or somewhere else knows the value of that work. So it's not that we don't have those pieces, it just depends on what, what we're doing is because of globalization, our world is becoming so much smaller, we're constantly shifting between these different worlds and using different values systems to judge each other and without looking at the wider context. So the art, is, the art does have a value, and it does have a value, not just within the uh, our African context. I don't really like using that term anyway. I want to be lo localize it. So within the Ghanaian context, for me, there is a relevance. But just because it doesn't always translate in a financial way or can be commodified doesn't mean there isn't a value because that value system doesn't exist. And I mentioned earlier that there's a transition going on between communal and capital. Communal has so much value in Ghana. Reputation matters. I mean, it's not just in Ghana, even in Lagos. When I was stepping out, someone said to me, you can't wear that here. You're, you look like you're going to the market. Like, even how you look, things like, these things matter. If they didn't, if reputation didn't matter, and that's a contemporary manifestation of it, we wouldn't be... We wouldn't present things the way that we do. We wouldn't put so much effort. Even when someone passes away in Ghana, why do families still pay so much money to have a double spread in a newspaper? Because reputation matters. Legacy matters. And that's the same thing that happens with these Adinkra stalls, that happen with the Evekente, that happen in Wawa, the way that they have these um, cloths that are made. We do have value systems. Now, that's the first point. The second one is about um, the responsibility of collectors. I agree with you. It's not right to assume that collectors have to hold the burden in the same way that it's not right there's an expectation for us as curators or people between different spaces have to carry the bag of Africa. I have enough things in my bag. I do not need the whole continent on my shoulder. It's okay. You can hold it. You can hold it, right? So there's that, which is... But what I do think needs to happen is if there is a little contribution from every stakeholder involved in either the contemporary art market or arts and culture in general, it'll make a difference. For instance, if a collector makes a donation, I think, or, or makes a uh, purchase for an artwork, as I mentioned, the model of the foundation, there is, it's, it's, build, it's feeding into something that's sustainable. It's just not about that particular. It's not just solely on that particular artwork. But equally, um, a new model that will be introduced at the foundation is that artists will have, the, will have to give a certain percentage, no matter how small, that will go towards, again, funding a development program for artists. It's very big in South Africa, this model of artists supporting, giving a fund to another artist when they reach a certain level. So it's a shared responsibility, and the foundation has that responsibility. We take it and we wear it proudly, but it shouldn't be solely on collectors. And that's because if we stop valuing everything as a financial transaction and about money and look at other value systems that are equally as important, then we won't always have this conundrum of where does the value come from. We can marry the two of communal and capital very well and very successfully. And I think that's been for me anyway, experimenting with Ghana must go forward and even being here is proving to be successful. So 